Welcome to the Popcorn Talk Network. For the online broadcast network that features movie discussion, news, and interviews, press one. Popcorn Talk. We talk movies. From the Popcorn Talk Network, the number one online broadcast network for movie talk, this is Bolly What? The show where we break down all you need to know about Bollywood and its movies. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Bollywood on the Popcorn Talk Network. We have been on a pretty long hiatus, but we are back and stronger than ever. So thank you, everyone, for your patience. I'm your host, Kanika Lal. Make sure to follow me on the web everywhere at Kanika Lal. And today, actually, we have a very uh, special episode. I'm joined by a very powerful and brave um, individual, if I have to say myself. Um, She's a filmmaker behind one of the most controversial, but I think much needed documentary uh, called India's Daughter, uh, which was produced by the BBC um, network. And it's actually been banned in India. So I have Leslie Udwin here with me today to talk about that. Thank you so much, so much for coming in. And also, thank you so much for just making such a moving documentary that hit, I mean, not only an Indian myself, but just women everywhere and men everywhere, you know, who who really resonate with it. Um, Could you just give us a small brief background on the documentary where it was based from for people who don't know what this is about, from your own words? So uh, the first thing to say is it's not actually a BBC film or BBC produced. Uh Uh-oh. The BBC. Sorry, my mistake. <laughs> <laughs> the BBC were the only broadcaster that actually invested some money, 40% right. of the budget, into the making of the film. Right. And therefore had co producer status for making that uh, as a co production investment. But it is a film um, uh, moted by The Fire in My Belly and a production of Assassin Films, which is my production company. Mm-hmm. And. Uh, I sat, as the world did, on the morning of the 17th of December, 2012, the morning after this horrific gang rape, and saw um, this explosion of reports um, about yet another Mm -hmm. vile and evil um, violation of the human rights of women and girls. It wasn't at that point that I decided to make the film because I've come across, as we all have, many such cases, uh, never quite reported to this degree, but nonetheless, we know this happens on a daily basis and not just in India, Mm -hmm. throughout the world. Mm -hmm. What was unique about this case and what got me to go to India, leave my family for the best part of well, I'm still away from them because I'm campaigning now, yeah. so it's been nearly three years. Right. Uh, was the response to that gang rape. Mm-hmm. We have never seen so many people out on those streets anguished with expressing gut wrenching pain and fury and demanding in the most beautiful, civilized, change uh, demanding, forward thinking way the change that is so long overdue for women and girls Mm -hmm. across the world. Mm -hmm. And I took this very personally. Mm -hmm. I was raped when I was 18 years old. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they were fighting for me. They were fighting for my rights as a woman to not be abused and violated. So the least I could do, I felt, was go out and join those protests and the way a filmmaker joins protests is he or she makes a film about that Mm -hmm. and amplifies those extraordinary and courageous voices. Now, here's the thing. This film should have been a platform of praise for India Mm -hmm. because there was India leading the world by example. I've never seen another country in the world stand up with so much courage and so much passion about this issue. And instead of that, what has happened? It has brought shame on India, not because of the film or what the film contains or says, Mm -hmm. but because of the ban. Yeah. And this ban must be lifted. It has to be lifted so that India can take its rightful place, leading the world by example and asking the other countries to join hands 
in global protest against this, the greatest unfinished business of our times, mm -hmm. according respect to the women who brought us into this world. Definitely. And it's so unfortunate, though, because India's government is very backwards thinking. The protests that you saw, the protests that, you know, in, encouraged you to go out there and make a message were by the younger generation, which I think or I hope to think they are the ones who are going to change little by little, day by day, India's backward thinking. Um, just to, again, just to give a little bit more information, you interviewed um, the family of Dorothy Singh, the 23-year-old medical student who was brutally raped and murdered by six men. I want to know your your whole journey throughout. I mean, your goals starting to make this documentary and who you interviewed and coming out of it, did those goals of what you wanted a state change or did your thinking of India's culture change? What was your personal journey through this documentary? Well, to begin with, I made an absolute decision before setting out that I wouldn't have a narrator in this film mm -hmm. and my voice would be absent. I'm obviously aware that I'm not steeped in the culture I have been going backwards and forwards to India. I made a film called East is East, which started right. a very special relationship mm -hmm. with India. And for 14 years, I have loved India. And mm -hmm. for 14 years, I've been going back and forth. And then I actually lived there for six months while I filmed West is West in the Punjab, right. which is the sequel to East is East. Right. I speak some Hindi, you know, oh. but I'm not steeped in the culture. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I was very aware that what I really needed here, if I was to make an honest inquiry with integrity, was to hear only from the direct participants in this story and in this case. Now, did my goals change as far as who I interviewed? No, because I only spoke to and wanted to speak to the direct participants, mm -hmm. but what did change was there were two in particular interviewees who I needed, badly needed for this film, and I never got. In the case of one, it was a, a very close friend of Jyoti, who had spent a lot of time with her at the physiotherapy college, and whose brother and father forbade her to come on camera. She gave me a research interview which mm -hmm. cracked my heart in two, because through her, I knew everything I needed to know about Jyoti. Were there any remarks you could say, or...? On her behalf, but I guess no, because you know it's a documentary is not a treatise of you know discursive points. So I could have had someone report what she said, but yeah. the power of a documentary is you being there in the moment, you living that point of view. No, but I mean now, person. could you say anything now? What she said oh, that yes. really just oh, touched your yes, heart, yeah? Because I read that, you know, that her her father and brother wouldn't allow her to be on camera. Yeah. Well, it's patriarchy. It's control of women by men. Mm -hmm. It's unacceptable. Mm -hmm. And she should have stood up to that. But it's very hard for a girl to have that voice and that confidence to stand up against the patriarchs in her family because she's trained not to do that. And they probably, the men probably feared she might get hurt too, don't you think? Or no? I think, to be honest, it was all a question of so much shame and dishonor adheres to the whole question of right. rape and rape victims, I think they thought, well, we're about to get her married. She's 23, mm. the same age as Jyoti. Right. Um, and we don't want her associated with this distasteful subject. Mm -hmm. It's distasteful when they think about it. It seems not to be distasteful when they do it. Mm -hmm. um, here's what I learned about Jyoti. She was exemplary in fighting against the very thing that crushed her. Mm -hmm. and that is the greatest sadness. Yeah. I heard stories from her close friend, um, like she would be walking down a street and you know how men stare at you because they think they're entitled to do that. Mm -hmm. She'd be stared at, she would stop, walk up to the man staring at her, look him in the eyes and say, what are you looking at? I'm not your property. Mm -hmm. She was a fighter. She was a voice. She was a voice. Yeah. She was empowered. Mm -hmm. She was in a, a Vikram rickshaw one day with a number of her friends. And um, one of her friends whispered in her ear that a man on this Vikram rickshaw had touched her leg inappropriately. 
Jyoti stopped the rickshaw, ordered these boys off the rickshaw and started yelling at them. You know, she was not going to take anything. Mm -hmm. She would say things. Uh, her boss at one point tried to um, get rid of her to rationalize staff. He just, I guess, wanted to save some money. Mm. Well, she really needed that job because that job was paying for her expenses. Right. And she simply, uh, honestly said to him, if you fire me, this place is going to fall apart. You have no idea how I am the glue that sticks. Wow. She was confident. She was yeah. empowered. She's the new young woman of India. Wow. And it's no coincidence that what we heard from the rapists and their lawyers was she had to be taught a lesson. Mm -hmm. She fought back and that's why it went so badly for her. Exactly. She was out at night with a boy who was neither her husband nor her brother. She had to be taught a lesson. Mm -hmm. And I remember there was one moment in my very long interview with Mukesh Singh, mm -hmm. the, who drove the bus that night, uh, who I interviewed for 16 hours. Wow. And there was one moment at which when he said this to me, I said, are you telling me that your brother Ram Singh, who he said had to teach them a lesson because they were sitting together on the back seat of the bus, is he the moral police? I mean, I just explained mm -hmm. that was the only time with Mukesh that I right. exploded. Um, it's just, you know, it, it, it's... I was actually going to ask because, yes, you you interviewed um, Mukesh Singh who drove the bus and he allegedly said he didn't in, wasn't involved with any of the actions, correct? He just drove the bus. That's what that he was says. what he said. Um, and you also interviewed the rapist's um, family through any, and of course, Dorothy's parents, which was so emotional, um, but they were so well spoken and so well, you know, put together. I was impressed by that. Um, but at any point, did you have any small, this could be a horrible question, but any small sympathy or anything oh, yes. for Mukesh? or the family, the rapist's family. You've interviewed a bunch of them, so. 100%. That mm -hmm. was a big shock for me personally because having been raped at 18 right. and having said nothing about it for 20 years, and I'm so ashamed of that fact, I have to tell you. I should have reported that guy. I don't even remember his name anymore to report him now or I would. Right. Um, I was so scared because I've never made a documentary before I've never interviewed people before. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how I would react when I sat opposite these rapists because yeah. I've been through the pain and the trauma of it. Exactly. And I worried that these demons would rise up in me and that I might hit one of them. Yeah. And for that reason, I actually practiced on four other rapists who were not involved in this case, one of whom I have to tell you raped a five-year-old girl. And I sat with him for three hours. But I was so shocked to find that I didn't feel anger. I mean, I lost my temper once in 31 hours of interviews with rapists, and I've just told you about that moment. Right. When suddenly Ram Singh, the leader of that gang of uh, gang rapists, mm -hmm. you know, is referred to as though he were the moral police of that society. But I didn't feel anger. Mm -hmm. I was shocked. I felt pity. Mm -hmm. And the reason I felt pity is, and we really need to think about this, is that it was so obvious, so blindingly obvious as I sat with these seven rapists over 31 hours, that they're normal human beings. They're ordinary men. They're not monsters. They're not psychopaths. Mm -hmm. It would be so much more comforting if they were. And yeah, the whole of true. effort of society is to distance itself from them and to say, we'll hang them, we'll be rid of the problem. Right. They're nothing to do with us. These are monsters. These are No, they're not. Mm -hmm. They are the product of what we teach them. We have taught them to look at women as subordinate, as not worthy of the same respect, as of lesser or no value. They see women beaten by their fathers. Mm -hmm. You know, how on earth do we expect them to behave? Why would we expect them to be paragons of virtue when we teach them how to rape mm -hmm. and how to hit mm -hmm. and how to traffic? Now, what you sort of 
I would say, investigated. You kind of got, you wanted to get the mentality of these rapists. You wanted yes. to know what made them cross that line of doing it and thinking about doing it. I think I heard you say that in an interview. Um, oh God, now I got, I always lose focus when I'm like in a really intense, but there was some negative backlash on, of course, there's a lot of negative backlash, which we'll get into on, on this documentary. But do you agree or disagree that, or first of all, do you think that this mentality they have represents all the men in India? Absolutely not. Okay. In the film, there are more examples of enlightened, positive role models there of are. Indian men than there are negative. Mm -hmm. It's only Indians who don't dwell on that or see that or focus yeah, on it. Yeah, they really thought you, you put India to a bad light, but you... The rest of the world is amazed mm -hmm. by the courage, the tenacity, the passion of men and women who came out onto the streets. The rest of the world joins me in admiration and praise for them. And it's only when they hear about the ban that the rest of the world starts looking at India as a laughing stock, which I'm sorry to say it is. Yeah. Let's call a spade a spade. Right. They have shot themselves royally in the foot. Yeah. They're worried about shame. Then don't ban a film that's asking for change. Mm-hmm. Are they, are they asleep, actually? Are they yeah, not thinking? I know. Because that's the only way I can explain mm -hmm. what they've done here. I went, I went to India recently. I was there in February and March, and I was with my parents. Um, we were in an area of Delhi, and I also wanted to film and just get the overall gist of it. And my dad actually asked a group of men who were very sweet, um, he asked them, Delhi has no, is known to be the rape capital of this world. I mean, what do you guys think of that? And they actually said, you know, it happens in a lot of poorer sections of India and in Delhi. So do you agree with the discrepancy of class ha having to do with their mentality no. at all? It's another way of trying to distance yourself. Mm -hmm. Anybody who says... It happens in only certain cultures mm -hmm. is lying to themselves mm -hmm. because it happens in every single culture. Mm -hmm. It happens in the USA. In the USA, one in four girls on college campuses yes. is raped. The US is actually more um, like the enemy within. It's more in terms of family and friends who do it to each other, right? But so is it in India. Yeah, that's true too, actually. It that's is, true. and I think but the figure in India of known acquaintances or family members who rape, yeah. I think it approaches 90%. Mm -hmm. it's, it's quite serious. It is an endemic mindset to the whole world. And why is that? Because we've always been patriarchal societies. Yes, yeah. Now, people don't volunteer giving up their power and their entitlement, mm -hmm. do they? They mm -hmm. often have to be forced to do that. Right. And we have to force them to do that because it is that, that mindset that is responsible for all these symptoms of the disease. Mm -hmm. The disease is not rape. The disease is not the rapists. The disease is how the rapists are programmed to think. And if you grow up and see a girl child being born to your neighbor, for example, and relatives come round and they're disappointed and they commiserate and they say, next time it'll be a boy. Mm -hmm. Well, what are you teaching them? If you grow up to see your older sister waiting to eat last at table because tradition and culture tells you that the men eat first, mm -hmm. then the mother, and then the girls, no matter how what their age is. I mean, I stood in Ravi Das camp and saw Vinay Sharma's, Vinay Sharma being one of the right, rapists, right. his brother, who was 11 years old, screaming, attacking his sister, who was 17 years old, talking to her like she was dirt. And I stopped him and I started yelling at him. And my crew got very angry with me because, of course, we weren't that welcome in Ravidas camp where mm -hmm. the rape, four of the rapists lived. And they got angry with me and they said, it's not your culture. You can't tell him how to behave. Mm. And I said, I damn well can tell him how to behave because he's an 11-year-old squirt of a boy that dares to talk with disrespect for his sister. Mm -hmm. And I will not stand by and hear that happen and not comment upon it. We actually had a little row amongst really? the crew that day because of what I did, you know. Now, by the third time I met that kid 
at Ravi Das because we kept coming back, of course. We filmed a lot there. He, he was like a little friend. He was shaking my hand and I kept saying to him, you remember, you treat your sister well. And we were then talking about it in that way. Really? So what is the point of not confronting it? I'm not saying he's changed. Right. But, but at there least was some there was some recognition. Thing. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. At least another thought has been put into his head yeah. for him to contemplate. Yeah, exactly. That's a good thing, isn't it? We have to face these things. Mm -hmm. This film holds a mirror up, mm -hmm. not just to India, but to the world. Yeah. And the film ends with the climactic exclamation mark of a roll call of statistics yeah. from around the world. Statistics not only of rape, but of domestic violence, mm -hmm. of female genital mutilation. Here's one. In Egypt, 96%, 96% of women have been genitally mutilated. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they have to be controlled. They must experience no sexual pleasure right. because that way they might become independent or go elsewhere and move away from their monster of a husband. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, what are we talking about? It's 2015. I know. Let's get exactly. real. Exactly. That's why I keep saying, like, backwards thinking. The elder, at yes. least, you know, the generation above me. Yes. Um, kind of going back a little bit to the, the mentality uh, topic we were talking about, a lot of hard-hitting quotes in the documentary, um, I could list them for a long time, but the defense lawyer saying, you know, uh, if you put a diamond out on the street, a dog will take it, or it if a woman is like a flower if she's she's only worshipped in the temple but if in the gutter and then the rapist saying um a girl shouldn't fight back a girl shouldn't be roaming around eight o'clock or nine o'clock at night tons of these comments what i think shocked me the most is just the hypocrisy of um what that showed and indian culture so I actually saw a reaction piece to your documentary. Someone kind of just interviewed a bunch of girls and, and boys on the street. And one girl said, we pray to Lakshmi, who is a goddess, for Correct. wealth. We pray to Saraswati, another goddess, for knowledge. And here you are saying this isn't a culture for women. What can you comment on the hypocrisy of these men and Indian religion and culture? Because India is such a spiritual religious place. It just shocked me that they, they would say that. I mean, A, I see it from the point where, after all, what can they say? They're the freaking rapists. And the defense lawyers, what are, what are they going to say except try to defend their... But the other hand, it's like, they're not that's, saying they it went to defense. an extent. Exactly. Exa it went too it much they to the limit. It. Yeah, oh, it's, yeah. It almost like, yeah. That's Here's what the shocked thing. me. When A.P. Singh, this defense lawyer, A.P. Singh, who had uh, made this appalling comment to the waiting cameras when his clients were uh, sentenced to death. Right. He said, if my daughter disgraced herself, and of course he means like Jyoti Singh disgraced herself, right. going to a movie at night with a friend, a male friend. Yeah. If my daughter disgraced herself, I would take her to my farmhouse and in front of my whole family, I would pour petrol on her and burn her alive. Mm -hmm. Now, when he said that, there were some murmurs of dissent within the Indian press to hearing that. Mm -hmm. When I came to interview him, that was two, three months after he had made that statement, because that statement in the film is archive material right. from TV. Right. And when I came to interview him, I was absolutely sure he would back paddle like crazy. He would say, well, I was emotional. The reason I said it was my clients had just lost, you know, been sentenced to death. Not a bit of it. He said quite unashamed. Mm -hmm. I stand by that comment. Right. I believe every word I said. Right. They do believe this. It holds a mirror up to the thinking. Yeah. Now, you know, I get... Um, and, and Jyoti's father, by the way, because you mentioned, yes, they, they worship Lakshmi, etc., uh, Durga. Jyoti's father said an, a, an extraordinary thing that hasn't made it to the film. So much hasn't made it. I've got 87 hours of filmed material. Oh, wow, we need to put up an unedited well, we do. other version for <laughs> online. That'll make Modi and Rajanath Singh happy. I let's know, do right? it. Seriously. Um, well, if they don't lift the ban, let's do it. Mm -hmm. Come on. Mm -hmm. Okay, I pledge here and now. If that ban is not lifted by the end of this year, I'm going to start putting out all the footage I have Good. on good the internet. Good for you. We're marking it here right now and it's going to happen. Done deal. Okay, good. I'm glad I'm the one you marked it with. One of the things yes. that um, Badrinath, Jyoti's father, said right. was, we worship the goddess 
but in our homes we treat our women like footwear. Mm -hmm. That's quote unquote what he said. And he should know. <laughs> He's not a yeah, gory intruder into the culture. Yeah. He's from the culture. Yeah. Okay. So very often they won't take it from me because they like to shoot the messenger. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm the white skinned intruder right. who they think has some uh, white savior. Which, complex. by the way, people also think you're British, which obviously Indians and I'm British not. people, you're not. You're Israeli. And it's so funny because every single article goes British filmmaker, British filmmaker. I'm like, no, it's Correct. Really. Correct. But and anyways. of course, British filmmaker suits them because they have a chip on their shoulder yeah. from British colonial times. Of course. Well, I'm sorry. You can't blame me for that because I'm Israeli. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, you exactly. know, anyway, I fly at 30,000 feet above this because yeah. the work yeah. at hand is so important. Yes. That actually, the this, trolls can carry on. Yeah. They call me white bitch. You deserve to be raped, they say. What? I've had a few threats to my life. Yeah, from Indian men But it's tweeting. so trivial at the big, it's the bigger so picture. Sad. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's so small and compared to the big picture, which you're yeah. trying to fight for. Anyways. And they're the pathetic, sad creatures exactly. that are about to be left behind. Exactly. You know? But I tell you something that moved my heart to an extent that meant more to me than Meryl Streep saying last Wednesday to a New York audience when she introduced mm -hmm. the film at mm -hmm. a special screening, she said that she will campaign for this film until it wins the Oscar. Yes. And Sean Penn last night oh. to an LA audience, he opened the film oh, for okay. us. And Sean Penn said, I didn't realize how important films were until last week wow. when I saw India's Daughter for the first time. Wow. Now, more important than all of that, the thing I prize the most is this. On Sunday night, my Google alert, which comes in so often every day, came in with a picture. And I look at the picture and I, my heart soars because I go, thank God the protesters, the voices aren't silent anymore because of the little girls who were gang raped this weekend and the weekend before. Yeah. And I was so dismayed and disappointed that yeah. where were those beautiful protesters right. who protested the Nirbaya right. uh, gang rape and murder. Where were they now for these little girls? Exactly. A little girl of four, four. who was lying in Safdarjung Hospital, the same hospital as Jyoti, mm -hmm. on the day of the girl, the 11th of October. That's when it happened to her. And she lay there, had a three-hour operation, a four-year-old innocent little baby girl mm -hmm. to fit a colostomy bag because what these men had done to her mm -hmm. shredded her from vagina to anus, mm -hmm. okay? And I at last saw a picture of protesters coming out onto the streets again. And I looked closer and my heart stopped because there were three placards in that photograph and one placard said, don't teach me what to wear, teach your sons not to rape. Mm -hmm. And the other placard held by the most beautiful young Indian woman I've ever seen said, thank you, Leslie Adwin. Oh my God, that just gave me goosebumps. Wow. I want to meet that girl. Wow. She has meant more to me in holding that placard up than anything I can tell you. Oh my gosh. More to me honor. than Meryl Streep and Sean mm -hmm. Penn and all of them. Mm -hmm. Because the courage mm -hmm. of that girl, A, to go out onto the streets again, and B, to hold up a hated name aloft. God bless that girl. Mujetum se bohot piar hai, mera dil bhi kitna pagal hai, ye mera sob hagya hai. That's such an honor. That is an honor. That has I made mean, all this painful journey worthwhile. Exactly. Just this two-year nightmare of yours and that mm. one side can just change it around. Everything. It's like that one small difference is just a huge difference. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Wow. That must have been a really... It was amazing. I mean, I could tell it's a very heart-wrenching moment for you. Mm. Um, I mean, I'm sure during this two-year journey, you wanted to give up. Oh, I did you give up. You wanted to go yeah. home. One day I did give up. Um, and by uh, the way, I have to say that's more Hindi than I can speak, so <laughs> <laughs> good for you <laughs> on that one. <laughs> um, so there was one morning when I did give up mm -hmm. and I wanted nothing more than just to go home and forget I'd ever embarked on this horrific nightmare journey. And I think casting back what led me to that moment of complete despair where I just didn't want to go on anymore was the interview with that man who had raped the five-year-old. Oh. Because I have a daughter, I've been raped. You know, it gets personal at a certain point. It does, yeah. 
And my daughter was 13 when I left uh, Copenhagen to go to India to start making this film. And I could remember as though it was yesterday what she was at five, you mm -hmm. know. And when he took me through all the details over those three hours, how he took her from both sides. How when I said to him, do you think about her? Do you, you know, when you lie alone in your cell at night, because I was trying to see, is there any remorse there? Is there any regret? Because he wasn't expressing any. I said, you know, does, does she come into your thoughts? And he said, yes. And then I have to go to the bathroom. Oh my God. So help me God. This is what he said. I've got it on film, right? Yeah. I'll be releasing that perhaps too. You so, should. You should. well, let them lift the ban, you know, yeah. and I might think again. But yeah. here's the thing um, it so depressed me, it so deeply hurt me that it was beyond anger. Mm -hmm. It was the deepest, most profound pity I could ever express, you know. And uh, that, I think, is what made me get to the point where I woke up one morning in my hotel room and I was shaking. Just woke up shaking, shivering. I don't know what I'd gone through during my two hours sleep that night, but I, my teeth were chattering. I was wet from head to toe. The sheets were wet. And I just thought, oh my God, I'm going crazy. I have to stop this. I have to go home right now or I have to call a doctor and get into a hospital. So I call home. And it was like after 12 in Copenhagen, mm -hmm. it was 5.30 in the morning in Delhi. And I thought, Kim, Kim, my husband will answer and I'm just going to tell him to book me a flight because I didn't even have the strength or presence of mind to book a flight. It was a breakdown, mm -hmm. right? My daughter answers the phone. She shouldn't have been awake, but she was. Interesting. And I go, hello. And she hears that and she goes, what's wrong, mummy? And I said, um, nothing, I'm okay, Maya. I tried to kind of raise my voice so that she wouldn't mm -hmm. get too alarmed. Uh, she was 13 and a half at this point because it was six months into filming. And she said, what's wrong? You tell me. And I just collapsed. I couldn't hold on anymore and the tears were rolling and I was just hysterical. She started talking me through breathing exercises. Oh, wow. Telling me to breathe in through my nose, out through my mouth. And then she said, I want you now to go and get a pen and paper. And I left a decent pause because I didn't have a pen and paper. And I said, I've got a pen and paper now. <laughs> she said, go and get a pen and paper. <laughs> <laughs> I still had to pretend, wow. but I left a longer pause, right? <laughs> because I didn't have one. Right. And then she said, now I want you to write down all your problems and I want you to start solving them tomorrow you're going back to sleep now for a couple of hours and when you wake up you're going to start solving your problems by starting with the little ones not the big ones wow and I remind thought, me how old she she was 13 and a half oh my gosh strong and females then, run in your family well yeah she's so much wiser more mature and more brilliant than i am this little kid i tell you no i'll tell you in a minute wow. she really is and at that point uh she said to me the words that I'll never forget as long as I live and the words that made me stay because I still would have gone. I was in such a state. And she said, and mummy, you are not coming home because I and my generation of girls are relying on you. And that was it. Very I powerful. stayed. Mm -hmm. Now, when I say she's more mature and wiser than I am, I really mean it. She mm -hmm. is responsible for at least half of the foundational thinking of the solution to the problem. Because yeah. that's what I'm now giving my life over to. Right. So I'm not making any more films. Right. Which will surprise, by the way, those trolls who have said that I made this film for financial motive. Yeah, I okay? actually, that was my next point before we go into <laughs> just the ban and the conclusion. Yeah. What shocks me actually is Jaya Bachchan's um, oh, comment. Yes. And I've called her Jaya out. Jaya Bachchan being Amita Bachchan's wife, being yeah. a very esteemed Bollywood uh, actress, an individual. Um, did not see your documentary, no. but she didn't want to. She thought that this documentary was giving more fame, so to speak, to the rapist himself, A. B, it was a commercialized documentary, I guess. And How C, dare she? you were gaining profit. D, you were paying the rapist. I don't know what you probably went through when you heard all that. I mean seriously disappointed that a woman can come up with all those pathetic, disgusting, 
lies Jaya mm-hmm. Bachchan mm-hmm. and I have called her onto programs when I was interviewed in March by Voice of America I said to them get Jaya Bachchan on the program get some of these feminists who have come out against the film because that's right. the other really disappointing thing feminists who are supposed to be fighting for women right only in India this is mm-hmm. my, you know in my experience it's the Indian feminists who have come out against the film right. or some of them not all of them um and I I said you know call Jaya Bachchan onto the program so we can have a proper debate so I can tell her that not only did I not pay the rapists but because I refused to pay Avnindra Pandey yeah, Jyoti's was, friend who's on the bus with her right I lost the most important and the only prosecution I know. witness I know if I'd paid anyone it would have been him exactly. how can you make a film about this case without Avnindra's testimony well I was forced to because of Nindra would not I come on I was shocked he wouldn't want to come on because he wouldn't be pay I wouldn't pay him he Doesn't demanded he money Does he want to be the voice for this cause cuz he's Clearly the one himself not. said this do- this was uh, not true facts I enjoyed to know what exactly happened and yeah. everyone else is falsifying it I'm so like So why didn't he come on happened? and tell the true facts I know. and you see here's the thing why does he say the documentaries are fake these are not true facts Right because now that he refused because he was immoral and asked for money for a, an interview that Jotty would have wanted him to give to prevent other women from going through the same thing right but he was so greedy that he could only think of his money now the last word on his involvement in the evening comes from Mukesh who tells us mm-hmm. if he's to be believed and Mukesh has been pretty honest in this interview i have to tell you yeah he tells us that um Avnindra hid between the seats now i wouldn't be judgmental about that frankly if that is what Avnindra did He's human. He's faced with six men and an inevitability of a gruesome fatal attack. What's he going to do? This isn't Bollywood. <laughs> yeah. This is real life. That's true. What's he going to do? Jump these six men like some hero? Exactly. You know. It totally. So whatever the truth of that is, totally. but the bottom line is why do I tell you about of Nindra? Not because I am happy and ready to snitch on people, but because he threw that stone Mm-hmm. People throw a stone at me, I'll throw a boulder back. Right. And I'm fearless and I will tell the truth no matter what. You know? So Jaya Bachchan ponder for 5 minutes. Hmm. If I paid the rapists, if I had the money to pay people, I was spending my own money. I'm still seriously in debt for making this film. Yeah, it came out of your own pocket. Yeah. all of it not all of it bbc put Mostly. 40% right, in right that's what i missed to the beginning 60% yes. came out of my own pocket right actually to be absolutely accurate probably 50% came out of my pocket right. because i did get you know a, a small grant here and a small grant there right 5000 dollars you know i mean like bits and pieces um, but the film cost a great deal of money to make the lawyer's fees were mm-hmm. enormous <laughs> well, uh what about jyoti's parents are they i mean of course they're just so Ah, sh- so and probably in shock. And they're But totally in shock. What is their condition right now? I mean, are they being helped in any way or are the families being They you know were helped by the then government, of course. Um and they were, for example, given a new apartment so that their conditions could be more comfortable and they were helped um I believe with their son's education because they have two sons. Okay. Um But I mean what is help when you're choked with grief? Exactly. What kind of help can make them okay? Mm-hmm. The thing they're praying for, the thing they're longing for, the thing that will help them get some kind of closure is real fast track in this case as the government promised them they would have and the judiciary promised. They said this was the fast track of case of India. Mm-hmm. Well, excuse me, it'll have been nearly 6 years by the time the Supreme Court judgment comes through. Right. You know. Now they want the rapists to hang that's what they're waiting for I I think that's going to solve nothing and I don't believe in the death penalty neither does India which is why it's taking forever for it to happen Well they it's taking They have been sentenced but it's just Yes there there's so many rape cases in India but there's just no punishment for these men No that's right That's the that's, that's the right big and that's why these men actually are so affronted mm-hmm. they don't feel regret mm-hmm. they feel affronted and indignant Why are they being made an example of and being given the death penalty when everybody's doing it? Exactly. And I'm sorry to say there's a point there. Yeah, that's true. Mm. There is. 
that's like an ongoing issue that I don't even know what could be solved. But I don't know. I mean, Narendra Modi, I don't really know what he's up to. Well, I can only <laughs> I, say... He did comment on the, on, 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 the, on the actual incident. He commented on the ban, saying the reason there was a ban of this documentary is because of more of legality. Yeah, the but issues this is there nonsense. Saying, right, so what he said was in... that the, the identity of Joythi was re- revealed, so was the rapists, and a, a couple other things. So, but... first of all, there is no bar whatsoever in revealing the identity of the rapists. Right. It was all over the Indian media. Right. I'm sure Mr. Modi G reads the newspapers. Yes. Right? Yeah. Those rapists were named, identified, there were pictures out of them long before I came and pointed my camera at anyone. Mm-hmm. As far as revealing the name of Jyoti Singh, the Indian version of the film does not reveal her name. Right. I had gone to India specifically at my own expense because I gave this film for free to NDTV right. because I felt that, you know, I was grateful to India for coming out onto the streets. I thought, I'm not making one penny out of the Indian distribution, not even to pay me back my costs. Right. Okay? Mm-hmm. Jaya Bachchan, put that in your pipe and smoke it. Mm-hmm. That's what kind of a gori I am. Okay? So, um... <laughs> you have such gori, I love it. Well, I have but to tell have the to. truth. But you already, yeah, exactly. We have to move on. We have to you progress. Have to. Yeah. So, I gave the film to NDTV for free. I went there at my own expense to cut the Indian version of the film because I would never dream of breaking the law anywhere. Mm -hmm. I'm a responsible, uh, law-abiding human being. Exactly. The India version of the film does not mention her name or her parents' name so that no link can be made. But they banned the India version of the film. Mm -hmm. So because of their ban... The BBC version of the film was leaked onto the internet and now everyone in India knows her name. Mm -hmm. So the ban was responsible for the leaking and the publishing of the name. Shall we sue them? Shall we sue Rajnath Singh, the Home Minister, for causing the name to be revealed by banning the film that did not reveal the name responsibly? Mm -hmm. You know, it's just a ridiculous mess. It is. It is. Here's what I think. Mm -hmm. They made a mistake. They banned a film without seeing it. Right. That's a big mistake. That is. Having made the mistake, just be courageous enough. Man up. Mm -hmm. Be courageous enough to say, okay, we made a mistake. That, what, what they did with porn sites recently, are you aware of that? 897 porn sites were banned about six weeks ago. And then they released it. Yeah. They lifted the ban within Mm -hmm. one week. Why? Because Indian men cried out. You can't take our pornography away from us. We're a democracy. Democracies don't trample on freedom of expression. But it's okay for the democracy to trample on the freedom of expression of a public interest documentary that the entire international community praises for calling for justice and rights for women. What message are you sending to the world? Are you asleep? Mm -hmm. Are you thinking at all because you are so worried about shame and accuse me of bringing a conspiracy to shame India? You are shaming India. Is it not an excuse either that they fear that it's going to just cause more violence and protests? That's just well, there another... was that. There was that. Yes, I got and an possibly email. even more uh, rapes, <laughs> just because of the anger. Well, you know? first of all, they can't. I don't be know more if they're rapes. fear. I don't know. Yeah, they're already <laughs> enough. But I don't know if they had that fear of. But here, they're afraid. They're cowards. You know what I mean? I don't know if it's a. It's a... I don't know. But the thing is, if they think it's going to cause more rapes, if as the you know that small band of feminists who called for the ban on this film, right. the feminists called for right. the ban on this film, and I will never forgive them for that. They are destined for that special place in hell that Madeleine Albright speaks about. Mm-hmm. Okay, now having. Uh, saying that this film gives a platform to the rapists and that there will be more rapes as a result. Well, admit you've made a mistake Mm -hmm. because I can show you hundreds, hundreds of emails I've had from Indian men. I can show you emails from Indian men who have confessed rapes to me in these emails and said this documentary has made them stop in their tracks and they feel so ashamed and they feel so... That can't be a bad thing, can no, it? Not at all. Show me one rape that has been committed that is linked to this documentary. If we could get into 
uh, the, the homes and the streets, we could probably show you several rapes that did not get committed. Right. You know, right, if one exactly. if, if one could prove a negative. Right. But, you know, I've had emails from women who have suffered serial abuse, who have said they found a power through seeing this documentary and they have found their strength and their self-respect again and they are now going to become activists and work to stop this from happening to other women. Mm -hmm. So what are we talking about? The film gives a platform to the rapists is some intellectual notion right. that has no meaning. Parliament gives a platform mm -hmm. to the rapists yeah, when true. parliamentarians in India have stood up and made hate-filled comments about women. Mm -hmm. Where have I ever heard a cry from anyone in India this parliament is giving a platform to misogynist views. Mm -hmm. Are you hopeful at all that the ban will be lifted? What's the, that? I was hopeful. I can't say I am because there have been now four adjournments of a petition brought by two upstanding, enlightened, wonderful Indian citizens, one of whom is a journalist, mm -hmm. the other of whom I think is a social activist. Mm -hmm. And they have brought this petition to the Delhi High Court, Justice Rohini sitting on the case, mm. four adjournments since March, I think, or April when they first brought it. Um, and. The first two adjournments were on the basis that the government needed more time to get its case together. Right. And the last two adjournments have been for, you know, spurious reasons. I think the last one was that the judge didn't have her full personnel in court. So now it's adjourned to the 9th of December. I'm heartbroken that the Indian people who I love and admired so much who came out onto those streets have been so silent. They've fallen into apathy. Mm -hmm. And that is... That has really tarnished my optimism, I have to tell you. Mm. Where are those voices now? Yeah. Why aren't they calling for the lifting of the ban? So I don't know. It may be that there is such a an oppressive sense of fear now in the Indian community because this government is banning left, right and centre. It's banned Greenpeace, for God's sake. Greenpeace, which is just trying to fight for our planet, right. you know? Right. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I can't say I'm optimistic anymore, no. But I have come to the point where now I don't care anymore. Of course I care that, you know, India should be part of this global campaign. Well, you're campaign. fighting a bigger issue right now. I am. You I'm know, fighting a global issue. Global if India wants to stay stuck with its head in the sand, right. nothing I can do about it. Right. Let them. I'll focus on the rest of the world. Thank you very much. Definitely. You're focusing on gender inequality, which is like the biggest thing. You're focusing on increasing education in these countries that need yes. it. You know, it's funny because, of course, you make these films and you, you talk about issues. Even being a journalist myself, you hope to evoke a change. Um, but the only thing I see it brings is just people talk, which is a great step. People talking about it. I mean, we already talked about your supporters. And these are like high supporters I'm talking about. Entertainment industry people, political industry people who have a voice, who could very well influence those the leaders who make the decisions maybe down the line but people are stirring conversations whether it's on youtube or on twitter or on facebook um but what what change could be made like what are the actions that we can do or that india's daughter is doing right now like your campaign and i'm very clear about what we need to do mm -hmm. i have over a two and a half year period steeped myself in this issue and I am very clear about what the problem is the mm -hmm. problem is mindset mm -hmm. and I'm also very clear about what the solution is and what gave me the insight into that was when I realized that of the seven rapists only one of them had finished his education I thought well that's significant isn't it they've had no access to education so it's the poverty the lack of education then I went and interviewed the lawyers. Right, who so are I, educated. <laughs> as educated as you get. Right. So it's nothing to do with access to education. Right. So I'm still inquiring and kicking it about and brainstorming with my daughter, who by now was 15 and something, because this was mm -hmm. in April of this year. Right. When the epiphany, if you like, or the answer came from this feisty discussion with my daughter, and we started thinking about what is it we are teaching. We're teaching our children to read, write and count. We're educating their heads. 
We're not educating their hearts. Mm -hmm. Nowhere are we responsibly as a world taking care of the moral, the spiritual education of our children. And I don't even want to put it in kind of, you know, academic terms. Respect, mm -hmm. empathy, gender sensitization, freeing girls and boys right. of the strictures of gender stereotypes. When I ask these rapists, what is a man? What is manhood? They have very clear notions of what manhood is. I pity them living a life mm -hmm. in which you can't fail, you can't express emotion. I pity these men. They need to be emancipated from that too. Right. Women are programmed and men are programmed and nowhere are we working to teach them that yes, they can cry and to teach the girls that they have every equal right to a voice and to participate in the economy of the country and the politics and the decision making. So we have to teach human rights and we have to teach it on a compulsory basis mm -hmm. and we have to teach it from the first day of entry of a child into school because we only have between the ages of three and five a really narrow window to change behavior and attitudes. That's what neuroscience tells us. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, between zero and six years old, mm -hmm. and very specifically in terms of cognitive modifiability, between three and five. How mm -hmm. irresponsible are we right. that we are totally neglecting making sure that in a school where a kid is there for a journey that will lead to lifelong learning, this child is not even being told mm -hmm. what it's like to be another person is not even being told that every human being, regardless of their color, their creed, mm -hmm. their religion, or their gender, is also valuable. Mm -hmm. What do we expect? How do we expect them to behave? Empathy isn't a quality that comes naturally to a human being. Right. It has to be practiced. It had to, has to be taught. Right. So I'm now advising the UN Human Rights Office on this Equality Studies Global Initiative I'm asking education ministers around the world to endorse and co-opt the global curriculum in human rights, which I have a committee of 20 experts and visionaries in education, in uh, gender, human rights, and psychology. I've, I'm gathering together this committee who are going to be designing and constructing in great minute detail those exercises and instruments and songs and books and poems and drawings mm. that teach a child respect for another human being, that teach a child empathy, that teach a child what emotions are, right. how to identify emotions. Right. Okay? And we are going to have this global curriculum set by the end of this uh, of next year. Oh wow. The following year and that's the early years curriculum. The following year in 2017, while we're designing the middle years curriculum, mm -hmm. the adopting countries, of which I have eight already, okay. those adopting countries are going to be adapting the global curriculum because there has to be cultural flexibility. Right. And in the final year, when we're designing the senior years curriculum, the adopting countries start rolling out the early years curriculum in their countries on a compulsory basis from the first day of education of a child. That is when the world will change, and it's the only way to change the world, as far as I'm concerned. You're like an actress turned filmmaker turned activist. Mm -hmm. And I think every single part of your journey is, is leading you to do you know, such important things for this world. And you can't do it alone. You totally can't. No. So for those who want who've been very inspired by today's interview where can you tell them to follow you and, and be more informed so certainly on www.indiasdaughter.com mm -hmm. and we have a sister website now for the american release of the film okay called uh, www.ourdaughter2.com oh. okay this was inspired by something meryl streep said back in march when she first saw the film and she said jyoti is uh, India's daughter she's our daughter too and mm -hmm. made the point as the film does that this is right. a global pandemic right. so on that website we do have various suggestions um, uh, clearly people can lend their energies they can send us glittering materials that will help our education curriculum mm -hmm. because 
as far as I'm concerned, we need as many researchers as we can get. We're, right. you know, like magpies gathering together all of right. these gems to put into our curriculum. Mm-hmm. Anybody who's listening to this who has any money can donate because we have to hire an, our education director, our research team. We have to fly me around the world. Mm-hmm. I'm depleted. I have no more funds. Mm-hmm. Uh, my daughter has gone without a tutor this year that she badly needs because I can't afford it. Okay, mm-hmm. um, you can host screenings. You can keep the conversations going because the awareness mm-hmm. goes hand in hand with a readiness to adopt a solution. There's a lot people There's can lot. do, and here's very importantly: uh-huh. you can come to the theatre and watch the film and bring people with you. Yes, on the twenty third, which is this Friday, mm-hmm. in New York. Okay, at the Village East Cinema. Okay. And next Friday, the 30th uh-huh. of October, at the Sundance Sunset Theatre in L.A., mm-hmm. we have five screenings a day uh, for a week in each of those cinemas. I'm glad to tell you we've also got distributors who have said they're taking the film on now beyond and going wider, which is fantastic. Great, yes. Um, and then the last thing you can do is spread the word that on the 8th of March next year, International Women's Day, Bianca Jagger and I are calling a strike of all women and girls the world over. We want every woman to down tools, to stop looking after the children, let the men do that, to leave their supportive roles Mm -hmm. and let their men, male bosses, Mm -hmm. take care of that, to walk out of parliaments to down tools and go on strike demanding the respect they deserve, demanding gender inequality, the last unfinished business mm-hmm. of our world. Wow. You're, that's that's happening next March. Next March on the 8th. Okay. Next March Spread on the, the 8th. word. Yeah, no, we definitely. I didn't know everyone about that. out there on those streets. Okay, great. Wow. And of course, think, men are welcome. Enlightened men course, are welcome. Of course, yes. I mean, I, I, I imagine the younger generation attending because they are the ones... Yes. They are the ones who want to see a change. Yes. Men and women alike, honestly. Well, so it's up we to must us. demand a change yeah. rather than just want to see it because we've of been course. wanting to see it for a long for time. Two millennia. And we're sitting back and we just need to take We need more to do action. it now. We need to take it in our hands and take that power that is rightfully ours. Leslie, I can't thank you enough for being part of this movement, for making a change of this movement, being a voice, a voice that just needs to be heard i can't thank you enough on i'm just of a me. vehicle i'm compelled to do this exactly i have every pressing reason to not do it i have to do it because the change has to come now so it's not me i'm the vehicle through which this voice is mm-hmm. and it's gathering momentum and look definitely. at all these amazing supporters it's not definitely. me alone doing this no it's wonderful definitely and can you please remind uh all the fans of the followers where can they find you on twitter and India's at, daughter's uh, social media as well. So we're at, at Leslie Adwin, L-E-S-L-E-E, my mother couldn't spell, <laughs> and at India's daughter. Okay, perfect. And please tweet and please beg the government to stop this ban so India can hold its head up high again as it rightly deserves to do for being the only country in the world that has demanded a change in the way those brilliant, amazing protesters did. Please. Kripia. Shukya. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you um, just at least took away a little bit more knowledge than you had before and definitely be part of this movement. I'm your host, Kanika Lal. Follow me on Twitter at Kanika Lal, all the updates. I will be certainly tweeting and retweeting Leslie's updates as well so we can all uh, be informed as well as follow Popcorn Talk Network on all social media. Thank you again. I'll see you guys next week on Bollywood. From producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire Popcorn Talk Network, we would like to thank you for tuning in. For questions or comments, be sure to visit popcorntalk.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of the Popcorn Talk Network. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Popcorn Talk Network or its owners or principals.